Man, I'm excited about this. I, this is, we're going to cover one of the most powerful truths in Scripture, and I'm going to try to keep myself from getting too excited about this. <laughs> I, I, can, I can just really let myself get loose on this, because this, this, this is the revelation that will transform you, all right? Apostle Paul gives us a spectacular picture of God's grace in the book of Romans. This is one of those foundational truths that revolutionize our lives. It's, in fact, uh, the clearer this is to us, the more we're transformed to be like Jesus. It's impossible to repeat this too often, and if you don't feel like you need it, I'm doing it for me, because I can never hear this enough, literally. I mean, I, I, I look forward to the fact that I get to teach this three times to, this weekend. It, 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 this is the truth we want to grasp on way, way more than just an intellectual level. To get this work in our lives, we've got to access it again and again and again. And that is the key. Life in the kingdom of God does not work if we're not accessing the grace of God. And the wonderful part is the simplicity of it. God has put this so within our reach, but we do have to reach. The Apostle Paul gives us one of the most practical principles of life in the kingdom here in Romans 12.2. Let's read this right off the screen together. In Romans 12, 2, he says, Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And what he's talking about is how our emotions are transformed. And once that happens, our character inevitably follows. Paul says you change your emotions by changing the way you think. God made it so simple. You can renew your mind just by agreeing what he, with what he says about your life, and his power will flow into that. Did you get that? You change, you renew your mind by agreeing with what he says about your life, and his power flows into that. Think of being born again like getting your house hooked up to UE. You know, they come out and put one of those little boxes in front of your house sometimes if you're, you know, on, on your own lot, and, and, and that means you got power. You got, you've got UE power now coming to your house. But you got to get your circuits wired correctly to be able to run that power. And especially in our case, we gotta get them rewired because they've been wired the wrong way. Because our natural circuitry can't handle the kind of load that happened when we got born again. Our natural default is to side with our feelings. And there's no power there. We're, we're shut down thinking I feel sad or rejected or anxious or angry or bitter or afraid. I, all I can think about are my problems and how impossible everything looks. My life just seems too hard right now. Now, here's the reality. That's not just me coming up with all that stuff. Those thoughts are coming from the outside. And what Paul is, is showing us here is the primary battleground is our mind. We have to change the way we think. We'll never win the battle with our accuser trying to change our dark emotions with positive self-talk. You know, I w I'm going to be happy. You know, I'm, I'm not going to get mad. Our emotions are not transformed by trying harder. I'm sure you've already figured this out on your own, you know. Uh, trying harder, not, uh, not to get anxious or to have peace, won't lessen your anxiety level. I mean, in fact, in my experience, it makes it worse. I get anxious about my anxiety. <laughs> that ever happened to you? You know, oh no, is this a panic attack? I think it is, you know. And the more I try to calm myself down, the more nervous I get. And don't look at me that way because I know you know what I'm talking about. It Trying harder not to get frustrated or trying harder not to get angry doesn't work either. Our emotions aren't changed by trying harder. They're transformed by seeing better. That's what Paul's really saying here. He's, it's all about seeing and agreeing with the way God sees us in Christ. That's what rewires us. Now, if you're a first-timer, I encourage you to use your handout and uh, fill in the blanks with us on this. Now, when, when some people think about renewing their minds, th their only context is staying out of the bad stuff, like porn or perversion, which is toxic, no doubt. But this is way bigger than that. This is way more than that. Paul's saying you want to interpret your entire life through the lens of grace. You want to establish your identity, measure your success, see your future, process your failures, all of it through this lens of God's grace. And here's why. 
because it will change the way you feel. And when you change the way you feel, when you feel different, you'll walk different. You'll start to experience and exhibit the kind of freedom Jesus and the disciples knew. Basically, the power will start to flow in your life. Your, your circuits will, will, be, uh, uh, will come online. But it's not like once you get started on this path, suddenly everything just gets better and better and all your problems go away and slip-ups totally disappear. It's usually three steps forward and two steps backward. I mean, you, you feel like, man, am I gaining any progress? But then over the months and over the years, you look back and you realize, man, I'm not the same guy. You know, I'm a different person. I'm moving forward. Now, when Paul says renew your mind, he's referring back to what he said earlier in Romans chapter 5, which is where he introduces some of the most profound truths in the Word of God. And when you first read it, it's just like fantasy land. It's like, really? In verse 17, he said, those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. And this abundance of grace is much more than being forgiven of our sins and going to heaven when we die. I mean, that's a wonderful part of it. I love that, but he's talking about way more, a brand new way of viewing all of life. Here's the dilemma we were facing. None of us can receive God's favor unless we walk in the righteousness of God, which is a problem because we can't do that, humanly speaking. We're all still broken at the heart level. There's still something evil in us. You know, the heart is deceitful and wicked and depraved and it's still all at work in us. Every one of us has it. So what's the answer? Paul says, God steps in and says, I'll give you my own son's righteousness as a gift. And just for the record, this is something so precious. If I gave you a thousand reincarnations, you'd never come close to getting it, getting it right. But here's the good news. The moment you submitted to Jesus as Lord, it became yours. Boom. It's the free gift that accompanies being born again. So the issue is settled. We no longer have to wonder about where we stand with God. His favor and acceptance go with the gift of eternal life. Even in our weakness, we can be confident that he wants us. In fact, it's better than that. He enjoys us. He delights in us. Paul says, you have received abundant grace and Jesus' very own righteousness. Everything is settled for you to begin reigning in life. Now, stop thinking about your experience because I know where your head's going. That's what's tripping you up. You're going, but, 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 look at me. You know, that's, that's what always happens. You know, just stay focused on what I'm saying here. And, and that's what will that's trip you up when you're reading the Apostle Paul. It's like, but Paul, what about my experience? To reign in life means God offers us daily forgiveness with a new beginning every 24 hours. Lamentations 3.22 says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new how often? Every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God is always, always being gracious to us. And not only that, we now have the power of his Holy Spirit residing in our spirit to actually do the will of God. This is, this is what reigning in life really is about. It's doing the will of God successfully and consistently. And when I say God's will, that trips people up too because it's like, oh, here we go. You know, for 99.9999% of us, that amounts to very small assignments. I think a lot of us equate God's will with huge stuff like becoming a missionary or dying as a martyr, you know, or, or becoming the, an evangelist like Billy Graham. Mostly, mostly God's will comes down to very simple assignments. Many people don't even notice, appreciate them, but God does. Paul says, the grace of God will result in you doing the will of God and thereby reigning in life. Verse, in verse 20, he develops the idea a little more and says, I want you to know how sure of this you can be, how confident you can be in this. Because where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Wherever sin abounds, grace will always be more powerful. No matter how much sin, how much addiction we're in, and we're talking about God's grace is much greater. When it's sin versus grace, grace wins hands, hands down every time. No matter how strong the fear, the shame, the anxiety, the sin patterns, the addictions, God's grace is way bigger, way bigger. 
And this isn't just related to our individual hearts and character either. This is related to cities and nations and family. Wherever sin abounds, God's grace can abound much more if it's accessed through Jesus Christ. That's why we're praying for revival and spiritual awakening right now. Because when the blinders come off and people wake up to the grace of God, whole societies are changed. When I look at the church in America right now, I mean, we got some serious slippage happening. In recent years, there's been a whole lot of folks who have just given in to compromise, denied the truth of God's word altogether. Dr. Brown was talking about how we've seen so many people just give up and walk away in the last five to ten years. The Bible says Jesus is returning for a church that's operating in purity, power, and unity. So there's a whole lot of ground to be taken between now and then. And the Holy Spirit has the answer. Where sin abounded, grace will always be more powerful. There's no sin you can commit that is greater than the extravagant grace of God. Now, look at what he tells us here in Romans 6, 14. He says, sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Paul says, why would you go back to something that almost killed you? He's saying every person who calls on the Lord and follows his leadership comes under the reign of grace. Living by grace means that we relate to God on the basis of what Jesus accomplished and not what we did or didn't do. And believers, are, all believers, are weak and broken. There are no super saints who come by this naturally. Being a Christian isn't about how dedicated we are. It's, it's all about the power of God's grace and the extravagance of his forgiveness. And Paul's saying, because we're all under grace, that sinful behavior, those wrong emotions, all that fear and guilt and anger will never have the power to control you again. It will never be able to control you again. Now, that doesn't mean it won't still tempt you, but it won't have the upper hand like it did before. It doesn't totally disappear. It still challenges us, but it's very different now because it no longer has dominion over you. You're not a captive to it the way you once were. There are only two ways humans can relate to God. We're either under the law or we're under grace. There's no third option. In in Paul's mind, this was so crystal clear. So before you were born again, you were under the law. But something radical happened when you were saved, and you came under the reign of God's grace. You're no longer under the rule of sin and death. You're now under this liberating power that comes with extravagant forgiveness. It's a whole new paradigm for interpreting life. When you were under the law, you were working to earn God's favor by your own strength. And here's the problem with that. Anybody under the law has to be 100% perfect 100% of the time. That's the only way to get God's favor under the law. And why, if you want to know why God gave us an Old Testament, it's to give us several thousand years of proof that we can't even come close, that we just fail over and over and over again because of the brokenness in our our, uh, makeup. And since, you know, we can't do it, we're doomed. Under the law, we're doomed to live under a boatload of guilt and condemnation. I mean, we, we can't have any, we couldn't have any pr- confidence in God's presence because our sin was always there to accuse us. It's just, that's just the way we had to live. But Paul says, believers have received the free gift of righteousness and the abundance of grace. They're no longer under that old regime, which means you no longer have to live with any insecurity about how God feels about you and thinks about you. You've got the truth of your emancipation from the rule of darkness right there in the pages of Scripture. But if you stay ignorant of it, if you live in uncertainty about it, even though you've got the power hookup, even though he's in you, your emotional circuitry will stay stuck in that condemnation and accusation, and you'll have no energy to change your behavior. Now, here's another part of being under the law. It's more than having to earn God's favor, it also includes living with the limitations of your own humanity. So anytime anger flares up, all you've got to resist it with is the force of your will. 
not to do it, you know, just to, just to grind yourself. No, I'm not going to give in, you know, to whatever temptation is pulling on. You're totally on your own. If you're under grace, you got resources. You got, you've received the indwelling spirit. You can interact with the Holy Spirit and access his strength. And he is always there within reach. So Paul's telling these born-again believers, God sees you under grace. But because your mind's not renewed, you haven't caught up with the truth about who you are, and your circuits won't run on the power you're hooked up to. You're, you're living like you're still under the law, uncertain of where you stand with God. You're not sure that he delights in you. I mean, you know it technically, but you don't really feel the power of it. And it's, that's the plight of many believers today. Although they're under grace, they still live with unrenewed minds as though they're under the law. And Satan takes full advantage of this, man. Believe me, he knows all about how to use this to his advantage. And his number one strategy is to accuse you. And he has never changed his strategy because he's never had to. It works perfect. He's never even had to upgrade the software. It, it, it works beautifully. He comes at us relentlessly, flooding our brain with everything we've ever done wrong. Everything. Now, I've been studying this for two weeks. What do you think I've been dealing with? Accusations. You know, I have remembered sins that I committed this week that I have not thought about in years. <laughs> Just to tell you how real this is. I mean, he will do anything to stop this information from getting out. It's like, just really, devil, really? You're going to bring all this stuff up on me again? Revelation 12, 10 says, the accuser of our brothers and sisters accuses them before our God. How often? Day and night. He's relentless. He's ruthless. And he's been doing it for thousands of years throughout human history. Here's what, it, here's what his accusation sounds like. God is so done with you. He is so unhappy with you. Look at the mess you made. You all, you failed again. You always fail. You never get it right. He is about to kick you out of the kingdom. You need to suffer. You need to show him how sorry you are. It makes you so conscious of that one failure and God's displeasure. And you just, it, you just hurt. It's just like an arrow that goes into your chest, you know, and I've had a broken rib, and I'm telling you, I know what that feels like, but it is real. It's that visceral. It's like, oh, God is so displeased with you, and you, you just live with that, you know, that thing hanging over your head. Now, I think it's obvious that mindset and the emotions that go with that are going to stunt your ability to enjoy God and grow spiritually. You, you get stuck on just that obsessing about that one issue, and you, you don't even realize it's the issue. You don't even realize what's really happening. I've been there so many times over the years, you know, feeling burned out and dead inside. And if I do force myself to read the Word, it's boring or condemning. And if I pray, it's, you know, one of those fast, I love you, Lords, but there's no life or joy in it. The problem is, isn't that we're not forgiven. We are. And somewhere in our head, we know it. We just don't feel it. We feel guilty. Paul says, look, you stay stuck in that even a little bit, you won't enjoy the Lord and those dark emotions and that sin will continue to dominate your life. Now, if we went around the room, all of us could say, I can attest to that, right? Because that's just the way it works. Paul's challenging us to resolve this issue of not being under the law with the truth that we're now under grace. The favor of God is is ours. His Holy Spirit is in us with all kinds of supernatural power to overcome sin and our own darkness. And we've been given very real authority to use the name of Jesus, which is more powerful than anything angelic, demonic, or any force of nature. All of that is true of every believer. But if we never access it, it's like walking around with a million dollars in your pocket and never spending any of it. You know, we're wealthy. But we don't feel it. Nobody would know it by looking at us because, you know, it, it could all change. It could all change. We just stick our hand in our pocket and pull out our wallet. It's so simple, and yet we're living in a van down by the river, you know. <laughs> just 
Romans 5, 17 tells us the abundance of grace is ours. It's in our spiritual pocket. It's all available. It's all ready to be activated. Accessing it is as easy as reaching in our pocket and pulling it out of our wallet. We simply say what God says about us. When he looks at us, he sees abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus. So when I agree with him, now this is so simple, you're not going to believe me for a while, so I'm going to say this a hundred different ways. When you agree with him, when I agree with him, I immediately access his grace. I immediately access it, but I know how it feels. When everything in your life is going south, you've been given into temptation, and you've got all kinds of things going wrong, that is the hardest thing to do. That is just the hardest thing to do. But God says, look, here's what's true. Where sin abounds, my grace abounds much more. And I'm having this out with the Lord on the way to work, on the way to church. It is work, but church, <laughs> it's sort of synonymous for me. <laughs> but but uh, I'm, I'm thinking about this, and I said, Lord, talk to me about this. Why is this so hard? Why are words, why, why this morning, Lord, why am I having such a hard time getting anything out verbal to you? Do, do you ever feel that? It's like, this is ridiculous. Now, it's kind of, you know, maybe it's not. Some of us are not morning people. You know, when Debbie and I get up in the morning. I'm not real, oh, honey, how are you feeling? You know, I'm not that way. So, you know, she gets a few sentences out of me. But what is it about God? Why is this that we just have such a struggle, a colossal struggle? I don't have the full answer to that one yet. I mean, there's just, other than it's my own flesh and I know there's a devil, you know. God, God wants us to say these things, to access these things, to speak these words. Just the hardest, hardest thing some, sometimes. Every situation can turn around. Every life can change. Every marriage can be restored. Every addiction can be overcome. Every nation can be experience recovery. But you have to say yes to the grace of God. You've got to speak the word of God to access the grace of God. So whatever excuse is coming to your mind right now saying none of this is true for you, the Lord's saying refuse to believe the lie. Line up your thoughts with my word. Say what I say back to me. I have received Abundant grace, the gift of righteousness, and I will reign in life through Jesus Christ. That's the truth God wants us to stand on. But I did this horrible thing, Lord, and I just feel rotten about it. I don't want to pray right now. It's just going to make me feel worse. I don't want to read the Bible. I feel condemned. I feel ashamed. I just want to suffer for a while. Just, I want to pay for some of this. That way you'll see how sincere I am. Just watch how much I punish myself. You'll see how sorry I am. And the Lord is saying, that is a total waste of time. That is just a total waste of time. That's how a man under the law relates to me. You're not under the law. You're under grace. When you sin, yeah, I want you to own it and call it what it is and, and repent of it immediately and then get away from that thing. Run to me. Declare who you are. You have received abundance of grace, the gift of righteousness. That's how you will reign in life. Say that. Agree with me on that. Now get this, because this is a, a critical part of the process. We have to say this to our own heart before the Lord till it becomes real to us. This is our confession. This is how you rewire the circuits so that it'll run the power. Do you know how the Bible says... We overcome the enemy in the end. It's in Revelation 12, 11. It says, by the blood of the Lamb and what? And the word of our testimony. So we want to say this when the devil's accusing us. I've received the abundance of grace. That's who I am. My life is full of hope. I'm a success in God's eyes because I'm his. I'm under his grace. I'm not operating. I'm not relating to him on the basis of what I did or didn't do. I, I stopped that. I'm under the rule of grace. Now, that's just not positive self-talk. That's, that's how the living and active Word of God exercises its superhuman power in those who trust in it. I'm quoting Scripture there. 
God's definition of success is so gracious. He's so generous in his evaluation of me. He values even the small, unknown, unrecognized things I do. He sees and values every act of kindness. That's what being under grace means. So when Satan comes at you and says, your sin is too great, you have, you have wasted your entire life. Your, your life is a waste. You're a waste of space. Jesus says, no, uh-uh. You gave somebody a cup of cold water in my name. I'm going to remember that forever. He sees even the little things you do. And he says, you're reigning in life. And you go, really? Then devil, I'm done with you. You know, in the name of Jesus, I have received abundant grace, the gift of righteousness. I'm reigning in life here and now. I'm not a hopeless failure. You're lying to me. Speak God's word over those dark emotions and sinful temptations and watch what happens. You just, you just say what God says about you. Sin will not have dominion over me. I am not under the law. Don't look at your experience right now because you, you're going to go, well, that is not what's happening. It's not the issue. Say what God says. Agree with what God says. Sin will not have dominion over me. I am not under the law. I am not trying to earn God's favor. I have God's favor. I am not under the law. And limited to my own power, the power of my own human strength and personality. I have the indwelling spirit. I have the authority. You use the name of Jesus. I am under a leader who esteems even the small things that I do that nobody else sees or values. And he rewards them forever. I am under the grace of God. This is the stand I take before God. Now, yeah, it feels right up here, but I know what it feels like when I'm in my car driving here, you know. I know how this feels, but you have to do it in spite of how it feels. You have to do it when all the feelings are going against you, when your accuser is standing in your face, poking you in the chest and reminding you what you did a year ago. Your enemy wants you to give up and give in. Half the battle is getting you to believe you won't change. You, things will never be different for you. You will never get out of this addiction you're caught in. Now, isn't that the lie you have running in your head right now? You're never going to get out. You're never going to change. This won't work for you. It's a bold-faced lie. It's the opposite of who you are in the grace of God. Now, it may take a while before you see this, before the reality of this begins to grip you, but the change will come if you persist and stay at it. I mean, I'm seeing things in my life that are amazing me, that, that, that just didn't seem possible five years ago. Five years. Yeah, you got to stay at it. That's the deal. I tell you, when you start to experience the liberating power of grace, it will change everything. You'll, you'll begin to realize the Holy Spirit's leading you. You'll become aware of his promptings. You'll gain confidence to run to him instead of from him when you stumble. Your track record of stumbles will diminish. You'll, you'll suddenly realize you haven't even thought about that sin for a week now. Whoa! Without this revealed knowledge that you're under the grace of God, you'll live like you're still under the law. And when you finally get so miserable and so addicted and so bound by it that you do try to change under the weight of all those dark emotions, you'll fail over and over and over, further confirming it's just not going to work for you. Paul says that whole scenario is a lie. It's a self-defeating prophecy based on what you're believing. Renew your mind with the truth. Cultivate a mindset of grace. It really will transform you. You want to evaluate your whole life through this lens of grace. Now let's talk about this new power source for a minute because this is amazing. Under the reign of grace, the Holy Spirit actually comes to live in your reborn spirit. Where did that time just fly away to? All right. <laughs> but here's the problem. Here's the problem. He's in our spirit, but we can't feel or measure what's happening in our spirit. Our mind and emotions can only discern physical reality. So this is where faith comes in. We have to believe what God says is happening in there. Now, we may feel his presence sometimes, but mostly we don't. So here's what typically happens. Christian gets angry because they're not thinking right about themselves or accessing the Spirit's power. They, they just kind of, oh, here it comes. You know, grit their teeth and ride out the storm for the five minutes or five hours or however long it takes to subside or worse, they just give in to it. 
But there's this whole other direction we can take. When we're tempted, we can talk to the Holy Spirit. We can put, wait, 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 push pause right in the middle of, of feeling rage or lust or whatever is coming at us. Even after it's arrived, right in the thick of the storm, we can just glance inward and say, Holy Spirit, thank you for peace. I'm not, thank, I'm not asking him for peace. I'm thanking him for peace because he hasn't abandoned me. This, this temptation is not proof that he's left me. This is not why I'm being tempted. He's still in there. He still it has all the peace I need. And as I simply talk to him, I start to feel anger starting to drain out of me. I'm just accessing his power. Now, it'll come back and the devil will say, see there, you haven't changed. <laughs> there it is again. You know, so what do you do? Same thing again. You apply this to lust. You apply this to food addiction, substance addiction, envy, any sin you can think of. You just keep leaning into God. Yeah, but I fell. Well, then you get right back up, and you get right back in the grace of God. Now, you have to do this a lot. It's not like you do this once on Sunday and you're good for the month. You know, this is not the way this works. This is what abiding in Christ looks like. It's, it's the nitty-gritty of this. It's interacting with the Holy Spirit consistently in life. That's what transforms you. It's how, it's how you access the grace of God. For instance, now, now let's just apply something else. Fear is something a lot of us deal with. Maybe you had a scary dream, you know, about something bad that's going to happen to you or your spouse or your kids and, or or you've, had, you've had a night terror where, where something, you woke up with something in the room, and it was so real. I mean, it, it's left you terrified. Don't just pull a cover over your head and ride out the storm sweating and panting. Take the name of Jesus and tell the devil to evacuate your room. Tell him to get out of your house. Break any agreement you've made with darkness. Break any agreement you've made with, with any curse somebody has placed on you. Command him to leave your property. Say, in the name of Jesus, I command you, get away from me. Get out of here. When it happens again, and it will, the devil say, see there, you don't have power in the name of Jesus. I break any agreement I've made with you. I command you to get out of my house right now in the name of Jesus. The Bible says resist the devil and he'll flee from you. You have to do it more than once. Luke 1019, Jesus told his disciples, I've given you authority to overcome how much? All the power of the enemy. Spiritual authority is delegated power. It's God's power. And we're authorized to use it in Jesus' name. That's what Peter did when a lame man asked him for money. In Acts 3, 6, Peter said, silver and gold, I don't have, but what I do have, that I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, walk. And the guy was healed, was healed. That's delegated power. Now, you know what? That was never rescinded. Nothing changed. That same spiritual authority is ours. Jesus gave it to the church. Now, I know how simplistic this sounds, but this really will work for you. You just need to use the truth of who you are in Christ along with your authority in his name and declare it against the enemy that's tormenting you. It's very straightforward. Any believer can do this. You can be born again five minutes and do this. It's not rocket science. When you're tormented, you just say, in Jesus' name, get out of here. It is written, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. 1 John 4, 4. James 4, 7. Submit to God. Resist the devil. And what will he do? He'll flee. Every time. Remind him of that. Here's a good one. 2 Timothy 1, 7. God has not given you, I would say it this way. God has not given me, read it with me, a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. I say that over and over again. One of my favorites is uh, Philippians 4, 7, where the Apostle Paul says, the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I'll say it again and again and again. The peace of Jesus guards my heart. The peace of Jesus rules my mind. The peace of Jesus guards my heart. That has calmed so many anxiety storms in the middle of the night in my life, I can't even count them now. Some of you will remember the analogy I used a few years back of a homeless beggar who was living under a bridge. One day a lawyer finds him and says, yeah, I got great news for you, buddy. You have, one of your relatives died and you just inherited $100 million. Well, it's bitter cold. He's shivering, 
hovered over a fire in a barrel. hundred million dollars. Yeah, it's all yours. We just need to go down to the bank down the street and do some paperwork to get you that money. And it's just about two blocks from here. The guy looks at him, oh, man, so cold. My feet are hurting. I don't want to have to walk that far. And the banks are scary places. I'm going to get in there and feel totally out of place. I mean, that paperwork stuff sounds like that could be real trouble. I mean, I, I, I just want to stay here under the bridge by this fire. Dude, it's so simple. We, we're just going to walk to the bank, talk to the banker. Nobody in there wants somebody like me. I'm dirty. I, I smell bad. I, I'll get confused. I look like an idiot. I, 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 I won't know what to do. Now, you're feeling frustration. You, you're, you're wanting to go, what kind of idiot are you? Dude, $100 million. But that's us. We're the beggar. We're born again. We receive a spiritual bank account filled with phenomenal wealth. But most believers do what the beggar did and never access it. They never go to the bank, never actually draw on the account. The devil gives us a hundred reasons not to talk, not to say the words, not to draw on the grace of God, right? It's just crazy. And if the guy under the bridge doesn't do that, he will spend the rest of his life in abject poverty. If he accesses it, he can live in total comfort. Enemy says, you're a failure. So you don't say, yeah, I sure am. No, you say, no, no, I'm reigning in life. In the name of Jesus, get out of my house. Anger flares up. You say, thank you, Holy Spirit, you're my peace. Temptation lures you into sin. Say, you fall into it. You repent. You run right back to God because his mercies are new every day. You say it again and again. God delights in me. I delight in him. I am a new creation. All things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new for me. All things. It's a new day. I'm a new person. The slate's clean. Those simple little interactions activate the grace of God in your life. No sin will have dominion over you if you live like a person under grace. Now, that's why most people don't understand Paul's writings, because Paul just talks to you like you are a new creation. He just talks to you with straight talk. This is who you are. You say, well, yeah, but what about my experience? Your experience will follow you believing what I'm telling you about you. Your experience will follow what you begin to put in your head Sin will not have dominion over you. It will not be the master over you. Now, the change won't happen overnight, but your heart and emotions will come online, and where sin once abounded, grace will much more abound in your life and in your family. This is real, friends. I'm telling you, this is real. And I just, I don't know, feeling like the Holy Spirit's helping me here this morning. I just feel like a few more of you, the lights went on. It's like, oh my goodness. Well, you know what would happen if I really believe what you're telling me, Ron? Yes, I do. I sure do. I know this would change your life. I know uh, three, four years from now, you'll look at yourself and you won't weigh what you weigh right now. And you won't, you won't be doing what you're doing right now. And things will be different in the way you treat the people in your life. Yeah, I know how this works. This is how transformation occurs. By accessing the grace of God. Choir, you better come back on here. I'm going to get wound up again. All right, let's stand. I want to pray for you. God, I'm asking you to make this real. I'm asking you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus. We've been living like beggars under a bridge and the wealth of heaven has been put in our account some of us have been living under so much condemnation and accusation and we put up with it and God today I'm asking you embolden us with revelation in the name of Jesus Lord break us free from this, these agreements that we've made with darkness Break our hearts free. You demon spirits that are tormenting the people of God right now, I command you 
to cease and desist, to stop the chatter, to stop the, the noise that you've got going right now. Let these words sink into our heart, God. Change us in your presence right here, Lord, as we're worshiping together. Illumine our minds. Awaken our hearts. Here we are. Here we are.